On today's episode, Notre Dame safety Xavier Watts won the Bronco Nagurski Award, given out to the top defensive player in college football. But somehow, he wasn't even a finalist for the best player at his position. And the Irish landed two big-time targets in the transfer portal, with potentially more on the way soon. That's all coming up next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Wednesday, December 6th, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. My name is Tyler Wojcik and I'm the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018 and now I'm a producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And today we've got a bunch of good news to talk about. Like I said all of last week and I'll continue to say throughout the offseason, there's going to be good days and there are going to be bad days. But these past couple days in particular have been really good for the Irish. Notre Dame picked up commitments from two of their top targets in the transfer portal this week. Former Florida International wide receiver Chris Mitchell announced his commitment on Tuesday afternoon, and former Arizona State cornerback Jordan Clark committed to the Irish on Monday night. So I'm going to break down both of those players and what I think they bring to the table for the Irish, but I actually want to start today's show talking about a guy who's been around the program uh, for four years now, and I believe he embodies everything we love about college football and Notre Dame football in particular, and that is Xavier Watts. Xavier Watts won the Bronco Nagurski Award given to the nation's top defensive player on Monday night, and he is the second Irish player to win the award. Man Tail won it back in 2012, and Jeremiah owusu koromo was a finalist in 2020, and cornerback Shane Walton was a finalist way back in 2002, but Watts is just the second player to actually win the award. And this time of year, everyone wants to talk about who's leaving and all the shiny new toys coming in via the transfer portal and on signing day, which is coming up here in just a couple weeks for the class of 2024. And I get it. Uh, it's really exciting. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of uh, new things headed that way, and that's really fun to talk about. But I think that sometimes we take for granted the guys who've been around, and when they finally get their moment in the sun, much like Xavier Watts is getting this week, we don't give them the credit they deserve because we're focused on all the other stuff, right? Like this week, there's just so much going on. Every five seconds, it seems like there's a new big name, the transfer portal. And I'm like you. I'm on message boards. I'm trying to find out um, how Notre Dame is faring with some of these top targets in the transfer portal because it obviously will have a big impact on next season and the seasons to come. But a lot of these guys who just had great seasons are giving out these awards, and we really don't appreciate it as much as we should. So today I'm going to focus the Open uh, entirely on Xavier Watts to give him the credit that he deserves because he had an absolutely fantastic season in 2023, and he somehow managed to exceed really every expectation people could have for him. And if you remember way back in spring practice, all the talk was about Xavier Watts and the season that he could have. And then he managed to have a better season than even most of us could ever have imagined. He leads the country with seven exceptions. And on top of that, he broke up four passes, forced a fumble, recovered a fumble for a touchdown, recovered a blocked field goal, and had 47 total tackles, which is tied for fourth on the team. He literally did it all at the back end of that defense. And he had... Maybe one of, if not the best game I've ever seen by a Notre Dame defensive player against USC when he racked up most of those Havoc plays, like um, the interception, the fumble recovery for a touchdown, all of that. And he effectively won the Bronco Nagurski Award that night. I know he finished the season strong, but it's pretty nice to get back at USC for a change, considering they've had like four different players stamp their name on the Heisman Trophy with their performance against Notre Dame. The Bronco Nagurski Trophy isn't quite the Heisman Trophy, but you know what? I'll take it because Xavier Watts' game against uh, USC really put him on the map nationally, and I think that game is really what set him in the right direction to ultimately win this award. But for Xavier Watts, it's not just about the incredible season that he had. It's really about his journey. So let's go back to when he was a high school recruit. He was the 65th ranked wide receiver in the class of 2020 and the number 389 player overall, according to the 24-7 sports composite. Part of that was because he was playing high school football in his hometown of Omaha, Nebraska, which is not necessarily a breeding ground for elite high school football talent. And he did have some offers from some Big Ten schools like Michigan and Wisconsin, but 
None from the powerhouses like Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, and the like. He was a little bit undersized. undersized. He was listed at 6'1", 190, but I think we know now that's a lie, at least pertaining to his height. He's more like 5'11", 200 pounds, but I think back then he's probably closer to like 175, 180. And then he got to campus at Notre Dame in 2020 during the COVID year, and he was buried on the depth chart. He only saw action in two games that season, once against South Florida and another time against Florida State. And if he had transferred after that season, it honestly would have made a ton of sense because Notre Dame didn't have a ton of wide receivers to begin with that season, and he was still very low on the depth chart playing for the scout team. And then Notre Dame decided to switch him over to defense and play Rover for his sophomore season before they ultimately moved him to safety permanently. He saw action 11 games that year, made 15 tackles, uh, including five against Virginia. And he really started to make his mark on special teams that season. Like I remember several times during that year when I was watching Notre Dame play and 26 uh, in blue and gold would make a huge hit. And I'd be like, who is that? And then I'd have to go back to the roster because I'd be like, 26, who is that guy? Oh, it's Xavier Watts, that wide receiver who's now on defense. Man, what a play by him. He was just uh, a tenacious player on special teams, tried to make his mark. And that was a great way um, to really make a name for himself for the Notre Dame coaching staff. But even then, Right, If he had decided to transfer after his sophomore season, I don't think it would have been a shock to anyone because um, considering the journey that he had had up to that point after just two seasons, starting out as a wide receiver, switching over to linebacker, which he was definitely um, not physically ready to play, and then switching over to safety. It seemed like Notre Dame didn't really know what to do with him, and if Xavier Watts was like, you know what, screw this. If you guys don't have a plan for me, I'm going to take my talents elsewhere. But he didn't. He stuck around, and then we get to 2022. By that point, uh, Xavier Watts had made some significant strides at safety, but then Notre Dame made him cross-train back at wide receiver because the Irish just didn't have any wide receivers at that point. Avery Davis had just gone down. The position was already very thin to begin with, and they just needed some guys in, able to, uh, in order to be able to get through practice. And I'm sure that Watts did not love that uh, decision because he was finally about to get some serious time at safety, still as a backup, but he was going to be on the field for quite a bit. And I don't know uh, the the full extent of what Notre Dame had him doing when he was cross-training a wide receiver. I think he was just getting some reps in there at practice just in case of an emergency. But still, it's annoying for him that he wasn't getting all of the reps at safety when he had a chance to really see the field a lot more. But even then, he stuck it out. He played all 13 games that season, and he started the final four in place of an injured Brandon Joseph. And that is when you really started to see the potential with uh, with Watts. Because before that, he was like a really fun special teams player. Then he was a backup who's making plays uh, at the back end. And you're like, oh, okay, this, this guy um, could end up being a productive player, but I don't think anyone expected what he would end up being. He finished the season with 39 tackles, a couple tackles for loss, three pass breakups, and a sack. And then that brings us to spring practice, which I had already mentioned. And he was the talk of spring ball. He was making all kinds of plays, and people started to talk about him at an entirely different level. And remember, safety was not a position of strength, most uh, considered, myself included. I think I spent several episodes um, during the like late winter, early spring about what is Notre Dame going to do at safety because the numbers were really thin. And yeah, we had high hopes for Xavier Watts, but we hadn't really seen him put it together for a full season. So I don't know if you could count on that. And then they added Antonio Carter for depth purposes, and that really didn't work out. But still, it was kind of like, man, Notre Dame really needs Xavier Watts to have this year that people are talking about because They have these great corners, but if they don't have any help at the back end, that's going to really make things difficult for the Notre Dame defense. So then we get to fall camp, relatively quiet time for him, um, and then the season starts and not much to report against Navy and Tennessee State, but then against NC State. Watts had one of the most impressive pass breakups I've ever seen when he literally like flew over uh, a wide receiver, managed to swat the ball down and not interfere with the receiver. I thought for sure it was going to be a flag based on how it looked live. And then they showed the replay. I'm like, how did he not touch him? It was an incredible play. And then we started to see a lot more of that as the year went on. Didn't have his best game against Ohio State, but followed that up with an absolutely huge game against Duke. He uh, had an interception off potential future Notre Dame quarterback, Riley Leonard, and had eight tackles. And then he played out of his mind against USC. I said it before. Maybe one of the best games I've ever seen by a Notre Dame defensive player, and he kept it going the rest of the way. He had two interceptions against Pitt, another against Clemson, and now he is the Bronco Nagurski Award winner. 
And yes, it is hilarious. It's incredibly ironic that Xavier Watts won the award for best defensive player in all of college football, but he wasn't even a finalist for the Jim Thorpe Award, which is given out to the best defensive back. These college football awards, man, maybe it's a perfect um, example of the sport and how dumb it is. This week, a lot of people are realizing, wait, how does the college football playoff work? And they're realizing just how truly dumb this sport that we love so much really is. But it doesn't matter. He won the award uh, that is bigger and better. And he, he's just, he just has an awesome story. It seems improbable in the modern era. And so many guys had left in the situation, but he didn't. He stuck it out, and he was rewarded for his efforts. Not only that, um, Xavier Watts told reporters on Tuesday that he fully intends on playing in the Sun Bowl. And there's going to be a lot of guys in Notre Dame who are going to opt out. Maris Leofau actually announced um, on Tuesday that he will not be participating in the Sun Bowl. I'm sure that there's going to be more to come here in the coming days, but not Xavier Watts. And even though he's still undecided about whether or not he's going to enter the NFL draft, he said point blank, I just want to play football. And he's going to play for Notre Dame in the Sun Bowl. Um, I don't know if he's going to come back for next year. Um, some people think he's going to come back. Some people think he's going to leave. I know that he's on track to earn his master's degree in May. I'm not really sure how that factors into his decision, but I think it's very cool that he's going to get that master's degree uh, amidst all the success that he's having on the football field uh, so far. And uh, to be honest with you, I think that it probably makes the most sense for him to leave now because he just won the award for Defensive Player of the Year. I don't really know how you top that. Um, it doesn't seem possible that he could come back and have a better year in 2024 than what he's had in 2023. Uh, I'm sure that there are some NFL scouts who would like to see him play a little bit more safety since he's pretty inexperienced at the position. But then again, he's exceeded every possible expectation anyone on the outside has had for him since he stepped foot on campus. So who am I to say that he can't be even better next season? And if he does leave, I think fans should applaud him for everything he's done for Notre Dame, his impact is going to go far beyond just this season. He's going to be the poster child for guys who come to Notre Dame and handle adversity during their first couple of years. The coaching staff is going to point to Xavier Watts' story to show guys that if they stick around and they continue to work hard and they continue to battle through adversity and do what's best for the team, it is going to pay off. And Xavier Watts, like, there's just no better example than that. So it's not going to sway every player, but I think it's going to sway the right players. And even though we might not see it on Saturdays next year, if Xavier Watts does decide to leave, he's just one of those special players who will leave the program better than he found it, and he will have a legacy at Notre Dame for a long, long time whenever he decides to move on to the next level. All right, coming up next, the Irish landed a big-time wide receiver in the transfer portal this week, and I think he has the potential to be wide receiver number one for the Irish next fall. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of real life, but can we just talk for a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. That is scary. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if one of my friends or family members got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from the life-saving medication they needed. Thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use offer code Locked On to get $20 off your order. Before we continue, please take a moment to like the video below and subscribe to the channel if you're watching the program on YouTube. Or if you're listening to the podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you rate the show five stars, leave a review, and subscribe from wherever it is that you get your podcast. Okay, we spent all of last week talking about the wide receivers, four of them, who chose to leave Notre Dame, and now it's time to talk about a player uh, who is working to replace them. Former FIU receiver Chris Mitchell was on campus over the weekend for his official visit, and he made his commitment to Notre Dame official on Tuesday. Here's what you need to know about him. He's six foot one, 175, and he's from Jacksonville, Florida. He is a grad transfer, and he'll be using his sixth and final year of eligibility for the Irish next fall. His last season at FIU was spectacular. He racked up 64 catches for 1,118 yards and seven touchdowns for the Panthers. That comes out to seven point or 17.5 yards per catch with a whopping 453 yards after the catch. Not only that, he only had three drops on 92 targets. So statistically, 
Really impressive player. Notre Dame certainly needed a wide receiver, or they needed multiple wide receivers in the transfer portal. And the fact that they were able to move so quickly uh, with Chris Mitchell says a lot. I think getting a guy like this, he's very highly sought after. He's one of the top 10 receivers in the transfer portal right now. And the fact that Notre Dame was able to get him on campus and make a move on him right away is really good because they have a lot more work to do in the transfer portal as a whole, but specifically at wide receiver because of the guys who I just mentioned they left earlier. Notre Dame is working to replace Braylon James, Tobias Merriweather, um, Rico Flores, and Chris Tyree, who Tyree just committed to Virginia. He's going back home to play his final year of eligibility, so good for him. Um, Chris Mitchell... Mostly plays to the field side. That's where he took about 94% of his snaps last season when he wasn't playing to the wide side of the field. He played a little bit in the slot, but I expect Notre Dame to play him on the wide side a lot next season. Um, looking at his career, he was redshirted back in 2019 and honestly didn't have much of an impact in 2020 and 2021, but then he really started to take strides late in his career as a redshirt junior. He played in all 12 games that season and made eight starts, finished with 23 catches for 348 yards and four touchdowns. Um, and I understand that some of you might hear all these numbers and think, well, he's been doing it against weak competition, and I get it. Like, FIU went 4-8 and eight last season. They didn't play, you know, one of the hardest schedules in the country, to say the least. But what really stands out to me is this past season, Mitchell had six catches for 157 yards and a touchdown against Arkansas. This dude's legit. And I, I know that Arkansas isn't like Georgia or Alabama or anything like that, but that is a, that's going up against an SEC team who's got some talented playmakers at defensive back, and he straight up torched them. So that is a sign to me that he's going to be able to play against some of the better defenses Notre Dame has in their schedule next season. His best game of his career was against Maine. He had nine catches for 200 yards, or 201 yards, excuse me, and two touchdowns. And he was FIU's first, second, maybe even third option. Their second leading receiver had 36 receptions less than Chris Mitchell did, so he was their main guy. They would go to him in all sorts of situations. They'd go to him on third down, and as a matter of fact, 44 of his 64 receptions this past season went for a first round. He ran downfield a lot. He's a great deep ball threat. Uh, I think, if anything, uh, it would have been nice if Notre Dame had him this past season with Sam Hartman because this is the type of player that Notre Dame was missing um, this past season with a quarterback like Sam Hartman who loved to throw the deep ball. Like Chris Mitchell would have been absolutely perfect for him but he was at FIU racking up a bunch of stats there. And uh, he's not really a one-trick pony. Like, I know that he runs a lot of downfield routes, but he did make 12 contested catches last season, including an incredible one-handed touchdown grab in the end zone on, like, a, a slot fade there. Um, he's also a pretty decent blocker for a wide receiver. PFF gave him a 63.3% run block grade, and I know that might not seem that great, but that's actually pretty good for a wide receiver. Um, so I think that he has a bunch of talent. He's very experienced. He's a veteran. Even though he hasn't played at the Power 5 level, he's going to bring a wealth of experience to the Notre Dame wide receiver room, which needs it uh, in a big way. And I would say for my concerns about Chris Mitchell, obviously he's going to be experiencing a jump in competition. Um, and you never really know with some guys that come from this level. On one hand, uh, he could be an absolute stud and put up the same kind of numbers for Notre Dame next season if he becomes the main option. But then there's also like the horror stories, I guess you could say, of guys like Antonio Carter, uh, the safety who transferred to Notre Dame from Rhode Island, who just wasn't really a fit at this level. Now, the difference with Antonio Carter was he was moving from cornerback to safety because Notre Dame just needed a safety. And, you know, and there's other reasons why that didn't work out. But I guess my point is when you're dealing with a player who's making a jump from FIU to Notre Dame or two programs of that caliber – it's really hard to say definitively, oh, he's got everything necessary because you just don't know. You're predicting how a person is going to adjust to a big adjustment in their life. So I personally am very optimistic. Most of what I've read about Chris Mitchell, people seem to share that same kind of optimism. I don't think that he's like a bona fide wide receiver one. I think he can compete for that role. I think the best case scenario for Notre Dame would be if he's like a solid wide receiver two or maybe even a wide receiver three if they continue to add more guys in the transfer portal. But the hope should be that Jane Thomas comes back next season and is healthy for the whole year and has a really big season because I think he was kind of robbed from a great season this year because of the nagging hamstring injury that he had to deal with. So this is a great piece for Notre Dame. Um, but they still need to add at least two more wide receivers out of the transfer portal, in my opinion. I believe by the time you're listening to this, 
Bo Collins, the former Clemson wide receiver, is going to be on campus for his official visit. Notre Dame is trending for him, and that would be a big-time pickup to go along with Chris Mitchell. Um, there's also Washington State wide receiver, or former Washington State wide receiver, Josh Kelly. He was on campus Tuesday. I would love to have Kelly. I believe he's a true wide receiver one for a Power 5 team. I mean, he was for Washington State last season, but he also scheduled a visit at Texas Tech for next week. I don't know what that means for Notre Dame. And as I understand it, Marcus Freeman is actually on the road talking to all the commits in the class of 2024 to make sure that they sign on signing day. So I don't even think he was on campus for that visit. I don't know if that, you know, had a major reason why he decided to schedule a visit for Texas Tech next weekend. But I feel like Notre Dame's odds of landing Bo Collins are significantly better than landing Josh Kelly. But if they're able to land all three, man, that would be a really, really impressive haul. So does this fix all of Notre Dame's problems at wide receiver? No, absolutely not. They still need at least two more. But I believe this is a, a, a significant start. And the fact that they're able to get it done so quickly is great because now they can shift their attention to getting two more if they end up getting Bo Collins and they really just need one more. And uh, Notre Dame has been very active in the transfer portal, which is great to see. Um, they did so well last year. They hit on almost all of their portal additions. So to see them make strides, and especially at a position of great need, um, it seems like they've learned from their mistake last year with the whole Caleb Smith thing. Um, so I feel very good about where Notre Dame is at right now in the transfer portal. Yes, they lost a lot of guys last week, but now we're going to start hearing about more guys coming in. I think it's a really exciting time uh, as Notre Dame starts to build its roster for next season. Um, coming up next, we'll wrap up today's show by looking at another Notre Dame transfer commit, this one on the defensive side of the ball and the son of a Super Bowl winning safety for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Lockdown Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Lockdown, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Lockdown Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Today's episode is also brought to you by FanDuel. As the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on America's number one sportsbook right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 Moneyline bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel lately, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use, and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. All right, let's do, uh, let's do a pick this week. I'm looking at the slate right now. Let's do the Thursday night football game. We got a we got a doozy on Thursday night. The Steelers versus the Patriots. The over under is 30 and a half. And you know what? I'm going to take the under. Last week I gave out the Chargers to cover minus five and a half against the Patriots. And guess what? They won six to nothing. I don't expect Steelers and Patriots to be high scoring. I know that's a really no a really low number for the total, but I am taking the under. I do not think we're going to see much offense in that one. So take that bet on Fandle. Visit Fandle.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. Fandle, an official partner of the NFL. So Chris Mitchell made his commitment to the Irish official on Tuesday, but Notre Dame actually got their first commitment in the transfer portal on Monday night when former Arizona State cornerback Jordan Clark announced his intentions to play for the Irish next fall. Clark is the son of Ryan Clark, the former Pittsburgh Steelers safety, who is now one of the biggest NFL analysts at ESPN. He's certainly one of the most recognizable faces in sports media these days. And Jordan is entering his sixth year of college, so he'll be one and done at Notre Dame. He's listed at 5'10", 185 pounds, and projects to play nickel for the Irish next fall. That's where he played at Arizona State. In this past season, Clark racked up 30 tackles and nine pass breakups for the Sun Devils, which is good. But if you look at his coverage stats on Pro Football Focus, I'll admit they aren't as great. Um... According to PFF, he allowed 49 receptions on 79 targets, which is a 67% completion percentage when thrown his way. That's not great. He allowed 519 receiving yards and four touchdowns, uh, and he did not have an interception. So when you look at those stats, you might be like, wait, why is Notre Dame offering him? Well, statistically, he had a much better season in 2022. He had 47 tackles. Two interceptions, including one for a touchdown, four pass breakups, and he allowed just 31 catches on 55 targets for 336 yards and two touchdowns. So he allowed less receptions, far less yards, uh, didn't have as many pass breakups, but maybe his high number of pass breakups this past season was because they were throwing his way a lot. Now, I don't want to put all of this on Clark either because the Arizona State defense was really bad. Um, so sometimes guys on his defense might not be where they're supposed to be. They might not be getting any sort of pass rush or whatever. So he ends up allowing these stats when it's really not all of his fault. 
And I've seen a lot of comparisons to him and Thomas Harper. And I think that given what Thomas Harper just did for Notre Dame this fall, that might seem a little bit high. But then again, if you think back to when Thomas Harper committed to Notre Dame last uh, last winter in that transfer portal cycle, I don't think anyone was like, super, super pumped about Thomas Harper. That's not to say that they were down on him, but he was just sort of this quality veteran from Oklahoma State who was dealing with injuries. And then he ended up having a really, really impressive season for Notre Dame. So from a physical standpoint, they're similar in size. They play the same position. Notre Dame clearly prioritizes uh, experience at the nickel position, and I get it. So in in, in those respects, I see the comparisons there. Um, But I think that, that bar might be a little high for Jordan Clark, but I don't know. Maybe he can prove me wrong, much like Thomas Harper proved a lot of us wrong with his, uh, with the season that he had in 2023. Notre Dame has had a good run of nickels the past couple of years. Tariq Bracey was really solid uh, in 2022. So if Clark is able to play anywhere near either of those guys, uh, I think that'd be great for the Notre Dame defense. This is a very important position. The nickel is basically uh, part of the base defense now, even though Notre Dame might have a 4-3 depth chart. The rover position is often subbed out for the nickel, and it seems like that is where Clark is going to fit in. So I expect him to be a uh, central piece of that defense next year. And I also think that Christian Gray, uh, freshman right now, will be a sophomore next season. I think he could maybe work in the nickel as well. Clarence Lewis, it doesn't seem like physically he's a fit there. So it seems like Clark is is definitely the leader to start uh, at nickel for the Irish next season. And it's a position where you have to be really effective at stopping the run and in coverage, which is not easy to do because sometimes you're going to be covering a slot receiver and then other times you're going to have to make a tackle on a running back uh, when he runs off tackle. It's a very difficult job, and I think that's why coaches are so inclined to play a more experienced player who's been around, who's seen it, and he gets the position. Clark has experience playing both man and zone coverage for Arizona State, which is useful because Al Golden certainly likes to to run a lot of man concepts. So I could see um, Clark being lined up in the slot on a slot receiver and having to make some plays. But I would say that his best strength uh, is his instincts. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that he's played five years of college football. Um, His dad, you know, he comes from great football. He comes from a great football family. And uh, I think that even though his coverage sets might not be that great. I feel like if he's going to be in a better position uh, on a much better defense at Notre Dame, I think he's going to be primed for success uh, next season. He's not as good as his dad, I would say, but he plays really, really hard, much like his dad did. Uh, if you ever watch some of those highlights from that Pittsburgh Steelers team that won the Super Bowl back in the day with uh, Ryan Clark and like Troy Palomalu and James Harrison, they were the most violent football team that I have probably ever seen. If they played in today's NFL, they would probably all be arrested for felonies. They were just that different on the football field. They played with a a, a violence and a tenacity that is literally not even legal uh, in the game this year. So he's not quite at that level, but I think he can really stop the run. I think that's reflected by the fact that he has 139 career tackles. It's hard to say uh, if he's going to be as good as Harper or Bracey, but I feel like the best thing about adding a guy like Jordan Clark is that he's played a lot of football. He brings in a ton of experience. And from a personality standpoint, it seems like he's going to be a perfect fit to come into this locker room and make his mark again. He's going to be playing his sixth year of college football. This is a guy who's been around. He's seen it all. And now he has a chance to play his final year uh, at a place like Notre Dame. He's going to be playing in some big time games, might be able to get a little bit more exposure than he ever has in the past. Um, As for what Notre Dame is going to do next in the transfer portal at this position, I don't expect Notre Dame to land another corner. They're in pretty good shape with Benjamin Morrison, Christian Gray, Jane Mickey, and all those guys. But I do think they will most likely need to land another safety, especially if Xavier Watts decides to head to the NFL. But if he decides to stay, there might not be as uh, pressing of a need there with Don Schuller, Ben Minnick. Um, and some other talented guys back there. But with Ramon Henderson hitting the portal, Antonio Carter hitting the portal, I think adding another safety wouldn't hurt. But I feel like Jordan Clark is another step in the right direction, filling those holes in that Notre Dame defense. And uh, if they continue, if they keep this up, uh, I'm going to be feeling really good about where Notre Dame's roster is headed going into spring ball. All right, that's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Uh, remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get the podcast. There's going to be a lot more breaking news. I'm sure that's going to come out. Maybe it happens tomorrow. Maybe it happens in the next coming days, but we're going to be doing a daily podcast here. So 
The best way to stay up to date is if you just subscribe on YouTube or on the podcast, then every new episode will just show up your feed uh, every morning. Also, you can give us a follow on social media, wherever you do your social media. X account is at Lockdown Irish. Instagram is at Lockdown Irish Pod. If you want to follow my personal X account, it's at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. Same time, same place tomorrow, guys. See you then.